All right. Hello, mate. We were going to talk about we kind of we kind of ended last time on um, on the note of uh, conventions and things like that. Reminiscing a little bit about conventions since we can't have them at the moment. Um, yes. What was the first convention that you that you sort of went to in, back in the day? Um, yeah, the first convention I went to was in New Orleans. Oh, okay. 1986. 80. It was a national show, and I, I think I'd mentioned about getting down there last time, but um, one of the, that was, that was actually the beginning of, of uh, my, my friendship with um, Mr. Philip Lou. Oh, no. Nice. Um, so I met him and his sister down there with um, Bill Salmon. And um, yeah, it was it was great because we were we were kind of the same age. Um, the funny thing about this was I hadn't started actually traveling traveling around the world with tattooing. I was still working in Germany, and um, it was just a short trip to New York and then down to New Orleans. I'd heard about this show, um, so. <clears throat> and Philip was on this kind of world trip, you know, a little bit like the uh, the German uh, carpenters do, where they just take off and learn tricks and trades from people all over the place and offer to work in people's places. And, you know, it's this kind of um, apprenticeship on the road, if you like. Right. So he'd, he'd done it the opposite way he'd gone from Europe to Asia and then to America, Japan and then America. And, um, yeah, I was just in the beginning of this thing. So anyway, we met in, in New Orleans at this national show and, um, it, we just hit it off straight away. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. I remember spending, a lot of time in there, Bill and Philip's room. He was he worked a lot. He worked in the room. He worked downstairs. So he had a place in the the Hardy booth. He was working at Realistic at the time. Um, so for sure, this was great. You know, I was actually sitting in Ed Hardy's booth, wow. chatting away with Philip while he's working on people <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was super wild. Um, oh yeah, legend. Um, so so this was my first convention, which was just a, a massive eye opener. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, crazy three days of very little sleep. Um, just yeah, just meeting the the, the all time greats of the time. Uh, and um, tattooing like in the hotels after. The, the conventions were closed. Yeah, the, the, I mean, that was that was the cool thing about conventions in the old days. I mean, it, it happens occasionally now, but mostly then it was like the convention was situa situated in the, the kind of complex of a, a hotel. So you'd have all the rooms, you'd have the restaurants, the pool or whatever it was. And then you'd have these rooms, you know, conference rooms, huge halls, if you like, um, where all the tattooers would work. So you wouldn't have to leave this place for three days. Uh, so everywhere you went, you'd meet someone for breakfast. You'd meet them in the, the restaurant later. They'd have little dinner parties. And, oh, it, it, it was brilliant. So it's very, it's very close. It's very, you know... And then, and of course, when when the hotel, if you like, shuts down, then the tattooers <laughs> open up. You know, so it was like you'd have a list on your on your business card from the hotel. You know, who's who in what room, and and you'd just go and and they, like knock on the door quietly, and you might be in Jack Rudy's room or. Um, 
whoever you go and you go and visit people and just sit down and watch them working through the night it was um it's brilliant absolutely brilliant and you were welcome i mean if you behaved yourself you know <laughs> right. um yeah it, it it was it was a very different atmosphere to this these mega shows of of today yeah right right so, smaller crowds i'm assuming as well right yeah much, much smaller i mean and and smaller but but very very serious tattoo people you know but, um real collectors coming from all corners to see the 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 new kind of stuff on offer or even they they had appointments and stuff um i mean everybody was working that's for sure um so it it was it was good and you, you'd also have like you go to 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 the bar i don't know, I keep saying i go to the bar all the time but you you would go to the bar and and see a whole selection of tattooers that weren't working there they might have had a booth and be be selling a few t-shirts and flash or books and stuff but the old timers um, so oh, the, these are guys who have uh, philadelphia eddie or um bob shore or the you know the um paul rogers would be there i mean you wouldn't find paul in the bar but um yeah and you you would sit down with these guys you see terry wrigley from scotland and, oh. um so you you'd be sitting at the bar having a drink with these old timers and and they yeah it was it was just it was fantastic it really was uh an eye opener, especially for for someone as young as me. I mean, I was I was in my early twenties, yeah, um, when this happened. Yeah, or to, or just twenty. Yeah, um, so yeah, just a a, a a kind of real smash in the face of what tattooing was could be and, and what it was what was actually happening um on a, on an incredible level there uh, you so, Terry, Terry Wrigley was he was he the organizer of that event because I know he was for the National Tattoo Association maybe at that time he was president of National wasn't he yeah that could well be because they I mean National they they had all these small events too so they'd have they'd have all those guys organizing stuff there'd be a dinner there'd be the competition yeah, um, there'd be like a little ball or something. It, it 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 was in one one way a little corny, and then in another way it was kind of it was it was very familiar to those people. I mean, the people who were in the National Tattoo Association were um, were a massive family. And they came together every year for years and years and years. I mean, I know I I haven't actually been to a national show for a long time, but um, when I did go, kind of regularly, um, it was always this feeling, always this kind of nice, familiar feeling, and. Yeah, the more you went there, the more people would see you and just, hey, you know, and it, it it was kind of you, you were welcome into this this club because that's what it was. Yeah, it was the National Tattoo Mache uh, Association was a club, of course, of, yeah, um, members, and um, yeah, they they, I mean, I I think I can count myself quite lucky because for a lot of those uh, little events and stuff, you actually had to be a member. Mm. And of course I wasn't. So it was like slinking in through the back door, you know, like, well, oh, I moved him, he's a member. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> um, so in the beginning it was fine, but it, it, it would steadily grow and grow by year. Um, um, so that, yeah, that was the first one that just knocked my socks off, and oh. um, but it made it made it kind of like wow, I want to see more of this. I want to, 
I want to travel. I want to. I want to go and see some some other shows. And so I can't really remember at the moment in which order this was. But there were there were conventions in um, Amsterdam, which Hank put on, which became also a kind of yearly thing. Um, there was there was shows in England. Dunstable was a um, a regular event. Um, I'm trying to think of it, if there were other conventions that I went to in the states. I think so. N not at this time. It was just a national show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I mean, I started to work at them as well. I mean, and then and then conventions started to like appear in in very curious places. Like I remember, we went to Hank's convention in ninety five or ninety six, and straight after this, like a few days later there was a huge group of us from Amsterdam that flew to Moscow for the first uh, Russian tattoo convention. Oh, cool. So this, this was great because this was a whole bunch of people on a plane for four, four hours to get from Amsterdam to Moscow. And then we arrived and we'd all be staying in the same hotel there and, Wow, that was that was a culture shock. I mean, that was like, wow, where are we? Yeah. Um, the cars on the street, you know, like completely. Yeah, you get so used to. I mean, yeah, Europe and America is different, but there were cars I'd never fucking heard of them. You know, it was just like these old cars go driving around, and you're like, fuck, I didn't even know they existed. Yeah. Um, was that a big hit in, in Russia? Was it a big crowd that it drew? Yeah, it was great. Absolutely great. I mean, there were there were so many um, eye openers because you had this scene in Russia that actually not many people had heard of. But there were actually people working on the convention with homemade machines that had kind of like syringe kind of looking tools attached to a a, mach a rotary machine with color inside where the needle was. And mm. uh, there was another guy there who was like showing us a machine that was just a, a it was a wind up, like a, a wind up motor, like in a clock. Oh, wow. Um, but it was an electric, not an electric, a wind-up um, uh, razor. Oh, wow. And they turned that into a tattoo machine. Clockwork and wireless tattoo machine. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Uh, for all the people using battery-operated stuff, I mean, there's, there's alternatives when you ain't got no batteries, right? <laughs> Well, they they were quite known in Russia for for the bit of the DIY, weren't they? As far as as far as making their own machine, I mean, it was, they're known for the prison tattoos, and uh, uh, you know, um, it was it was quite a thing, wasn't it? With the with the market. Oh, incredible! I mean, and anybody who's who's really kind of invested time to have a look at it, um, they do, they also do amazing work. There's amazing yeah. tattooers. They have their own thing going completely and um i mean of course now times changed instagram and we have connection with russia as much as anywhere else in the world but at this period it was like it, they had their own unique way of doing things huh? and it it was it was great and they were they were also i mean russian russian kind of i mean when i when i first got there it was it was like this kind of i i felt like there was this very kind of cold kind of um yeah not not a not a warm kind of character in front of you 
I mean, I remember walking around in the hotel and, you know, looking at the girls while um, we're checking into the hotel and uh, I'm looking at the receptionist uh, <clears throat> giving us our rooms and I'm kind of saying hi and uh, sorry I don't speak Russian, but, um, you know, trying to speak a, a little bit of pidgin English, make it easy for them. And I was looking at her and it was this stone cold face. And I remember walking away thinking, why wow, this is going to be my mission this weekend, just to get a little smile out of this girl, you know, it's <laughs> which I did manage. I did manage. No, but, um... What was it that finally cracked her? <laughs> oh, I can't remember in the end. I think I think it was my persistence. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that we, we, while we were working the show, I mean, they, they organized a fantastic show. It was like, you know, of course there was the kind of party before where we could mingle. And, um, of course that uh, I actually traveled there with, with Philip and Titine and yeah, there was loads more of us, but we, we, kind of had a booth together and and we worked on the show together oh, no. um yeah that, I, actually that, that and we had these small excursions a little bit to check out the the, the kind of culture of of moscow oh, very and cool. we've been, been pushed in a directions to go and check out a, a cool flea market the hotel wasn't too far from Red Square, so we went and had a look at the uh, the crazy buildings there. The, the I mean, it's amazing, yeah. The the church kind of looking. Uh, I can't even remember what he called it. The Kremlin, yeah. Like the Tetris looking. Uh... Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's outrageous when you stand in front of it. Um, so we actually. As of like Philip and me, we actually on this on this flea market, we decided to like get ourselves a kind of uniform that might make it easier for people to kind of recognize us. And we thought we might be slipping into the kind of Russian, you know, background, if you like. So we we found ourselves like a, a, a KGB coat. <laughs> and the uh, hat and and I think Philip had like a special forces tank commander uh, coat and hat and so we both had boots on and jeans you know and we we'd be walking around like we were something out of the military oh, that's and hilarious. if I if I think back I don't, I'm not sure if it was such a wise kind of decision but <laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't get into any trouble really. It was um yeah, it kept us warm and and put a few laughs on the tattooers faces for sure. He um didn't, didn't get his head shaved by any military uh, guys. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, that's but cool. uh, and yeah, Moscow, um, absolutely fantastic. You know who who was actually there too was Lyle Tuttle. Okay, Lyle Tuttle visited that show with us. He was, I guess, he was in. I'm not sure if he was in Amsterdam before or if he met us in in Russia. Yeah, but um, yeah, amazing. And uh, and uh, I remember one night there was there was a choice to go to like a a Russian club kind of discotheque thing where they wanted to make a party or you could go with the night wolves which is a, a russian motorcycle gang um to their clubhouse in gorky park so there was like a handful of us that just said yeah 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 i want to go to gorky park you know <laughs> so we got picked up in these vans and driven through gorky park by the river um and it it's it's huge I, it took a little while to get through but it was weird there were like these kind of military checkpoints 
where the car would stop and there'd be guards opening gates and then you'd go in, you know, and then it would happen again. And then, and then we arrived at their clubhouse and it was like this huge amphitheater, disused amphitheater that went down by, uh, towards the river. And so their clubhouse was right at the top and they'd made a huge fire and they were like just crates and crates of drinks there. And um, we vodka, st I'm stayed there. Exactly. Crates and crates of vodka. It was, it was hilarious. It was like looking at, you know, where is there some water or a Coke or something <laughs> to mix with this stuff? No. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay. So I, I mean, I can, I can actually vouch for, like, the Russian. I, I kind of learned how to drink vodka at that thing, mm. and um, it's after you've taken like two or three swigs of this stuff that it actually goes down like water. It's actually quite dangerous. <laughs> so. You're there and they've got these small Coca-Cola sized bottles of vodka and it's just that you can swig back on this stuff. It was very interesting. But there were, there was many tattooers there and um, yeah, these these uh, motorcycle gang, the Night Wolves, they, they took us also into their kind of garage and showed us all these old Russian motorcycles and it was brilliant. I mean, they were, they were top hosts, absolutely uh, fantastic. And this setting in this old amphitheater, and uh, it was it was magical. Yeah. Oh, so um, yeah, this 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 was like Russia. Um, we continue to to travel together i mean we worked in amsterdam every year like i said at hank's show um this was also a gathering of the tribes i mean people coming from all over the place hey, greg irons um, was was uh, some of those wasn't he um he was at the, the early very one. first one okay which i actually never managed to get to my my spark in tattooing was there i remember being completely broke trying to scavenge some like borrow some money off some friends to get there but um unfortunately i didn't make that show um but i i've heard lots of good stories about it um Greg Irons, Bob Roberts, um, to name but a few. Philip Philip was working there too, and I, I yeah, remember Philip talking about you know like oh I was shitting myself the first time at a tattoo convention working, and you know it's like for him uh, uh, also the breakthrough into into this new kind of way of life, if you like, yeah with travel and um yeah i was thinking like um yeah it's all it's all a kind of mishmash it's a, it it's yeah learn um the convention from from the uh the english boys as well from like lal hardy and ian of reading um and a couple of other guys they put on a, a big show in in dunstable Mm. which also became a great hit. Um, this was truly like a mix of um, absolutely everybody. So you had tattooing on a, a world standard, people from all over the world, but you'd also have like super heavy, like the kind of S&M crew, oh, the, yeah. the, piercing, the piercing gang. So it it was a true freak show. It was brilliant because, but also like this, I think that's what's quite magical about tattooing in that sense is it doesn't matter at a tattoo convention who's there. It's like we all have something in common I think this is a little bit like a tattoo shop, if you like. 
it becomes this kind of neutral ground. People yeah. come in for one thing in common and, and it's kind of rare that it's like, you know, that it gets heated or, I mean, today it's very different, but, you know, going back 30, 40 years ago, um, <clears throat> yeah, these shows have so many different kinds of characters in them from bikers to, uh, you know, guys in uh, S&M leather kits, um, whatever it was and they're all drinking at the bar together it's uh, maybe not together but next to each other you know so um it's it's yeah it's it's a nice thing to see that there's this kind of camaraderie um, in many many parts of society um, does that make sense it's like this uh, just this this kind of this ease in the atmosphere. It's not like there's, there's this kind of like, yeah, the, the, this kind of atmosphere of like, if you go to a punk concert and there's the skinheads over there, or, you know, it's, 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 it's quite different. I mean, that maybe that's not the right thing, but punks and rockers, or I remember going to, to see Motorhead and, and walking in with my mate and I've got a Mohican and he's got a pink Mohican and, you know, and we walk into a, a, a theater and Motorhead's just about to start and there's fucking thousands of Grebos like ready for this to happen. And we walk in, we're the only two punks in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, fuck if eyes had daggers, it's like, what the fuck are you doing it? <laughs> and we were in the second row, so it was like. <laughs> Whereas tattoo, um, everybody was accepting of everyone else, and there was no. Yeah, judgment. exactly, exactly. It's. Uh, I think it, it's a it's a good scene. It's it's definitely a good scene. Like, um, you know, you you go to these conventions, you end up meeting people, and and. You know, surely this leads to being able to do guest work for for people and things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, I I when I actually started to travel, it wasn't wasn't necessarily like for, um, meeting people in conventions in the beginning. It was more kind of like pinpointing my favorites. Um, mm. people I was really interested in going to look at how they do things, whether it was machine building or color or their tattoos for sure. Um, I remember when I, when I started tattooing and I, I left Germany, I came back to England for, um, I, it, it was a short period, but I actually went to Mickey Sharp's Oh, cool. Um, who I who I briefly met, um, so I went to meet him for for a day and hung out in the shop, watched him work a little, and and he bought a machine, and you know we had a, a super talks. He was very 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 open with um, all the the technical talk, and uh, you know they're kind kind of like mad professors. Yeah, it's like when you when you show some interest, it's like they go they go off the wall. They take you into their like workshop, and they're like, "Oh yeah, but you can try this, or you can do that. Do you want to come up and build it your own machine? And you know, I'll show you some. Oh, we can do something different. And um, it, it, it yeah, it it was like totally overload. Yeah? When you when you go in these places, it was it was like this information was just balling you over because you, you you're getting so much from just kind of sitting in a shop and tattooing and learning how to talk to people, um, cleaning up the shop, maybe mixing colors, making needles. You know your brain's kind of full, yeah, and then you're you're eager to learn more, 
And then you meet these enthusiastic mad professors who are just like ramming it down your throat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I ended up actually going back to, to Mickey Sharp's place and spending a couple of weeks there. And I built machines and, and tattooed there. And um, it was fantastic. I mean, he's not only just inside the tattoo world, but I, I was interested in his kind of, yeah, just his persona and, and how he, he sort of saw the world. He liked a little bit the, the kind of magic, what was going on in, in tattooing. He'd like to believe in energies and, and talk about kind of um, tarot cards and the mystic and the this and the that. And it, it, was, it was cool. It was interesting. Yeah? It was this kind of spacey little trip, yeah, um, which, which did make sense as well. It was like the, the kind of power behind people who tattoo is, is quite incredible, yeah. It's like when you, when you have your customer in the chair, of course, it's, it's um, making them feel comfortable and, and the whole design thing and the tattoo thing. But beyond that, there's there's lots of other stuff going on. Yeah, it's like they're there to get get a tattoo, maybe to feel more protected, and um, the other stuff is like, I mean, you're you're very vulnerable when you're getting tattooed, so you start opening up and talking about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, as a a tattooee, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it, it was it was very kind of enlightening being around people like that. Um, so from from there, I I went to America. I thought, oh, I can I can like tattoo on my own in New York. That was a, not the case. I I didn't really make it on my own, um, but. I'd met Shotzi Gorman at this, um, I think it was a, a tattoo convention. And then I'd, I'd met him at this tattoo meeting. There was this New York tattoo club on the Lower East Side and they used to get together every month and there'd be a whole bunch of people going there. And <clears throat> it was held in a small bar and People would talk about, you know, um, new tattooers and who was working in New York and, um, yeah, enthusiasts. Just going what, Was it still underground together. at that point? Was it still, like, illegal at that point in New York? Totally, totally, yeah. 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 So this was, this was, like, a, a place where people could go and, like, share their enthusiasm and their... their tattoos and yeah look at each other's tattoo oh, i got some new stuff and yeah it was it was uh also very cool so that yeah i think i said i worked for shotzi and then from there it was also like starting to move towards asia so yeah i'd like to i'd like to point that out again it was like this 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 kind of thing, which is, it, it came to me not long ago. It's kind of funny. It's like Philip went from Europe over Asia to America and then finally came back home to, to Lausanne and like had done this big tour of the world. And I was going the opposite way, you know, it was like I went to New York and then I went to, to uh, Seattle and then to um, Japan and had made this trip in between to Hawaii and then down to Hong Kong and um, Thailand, back to, to uh, Amsterdam. So it, it was quite funny. We, we'd kind of met on this, like these trips going the, the opposite ways around the world uh, um, and, and was, kept was, in touch oh and was san francisco on that on that journey as well or, or did that come afterwards that came later 
that came okay. later. That was like on a, a trip, I think. What what I used to do was like while I was living in, in um, Japan, it was like I'd have to leave uh, because of my visa like right. every three or four months. And then you could come back again after that. So I would, yeah, I would, I would leave, especially for the summer, because it's so fucking hot. It's so humid, hot. And I, I stayed there for, I think, two years in the summer. And it's like you walk outside and you're just sopping wet. It's like, and you look at, you look around and you think, what the hell? There's loads of pe loads of guys in suits, you know, businessmen walking around, and you're thinking, "What the fuck? I've got a t-shirt on and I'm sopping wet." <laughs> so I decided, like, on this while I was in Japan, that I would actually leave for the the summertime because I could, just couldn't deal with it. So yeah. I would I would move, go go to America and England and head back to Japan after the summer. So I'd be gone for maybe five months or something. Mm. Um, so that was one of those those uh, trips away from Japan where I actually went back to San Francisco and um, spent some time with Bill and Junie. And yeah, fantastic. I mean, just... Uh, I think, yeah, I, w I was making this point before as well that this um, this kind of period of, of, it was over seven years of being constantly on the road. Um, so you'd spend three or four months somewhere and then you'd go somewhere else and then it was all new and you spend another, like, well, I think, Mostly, I would spend minimum six weeks to two months wherever I went. So it was this constant feeling of refreshment, of something new, um, and it being just, just yeah, enlightening each time, you know, and and having the time also to get to know people to get to know the local ways, to get to know the food. The, the, it was it was just brilliant. So you're kind of spoiled in life. I mean, I, I, I think that's why it was so difficult for me years later to actually stop that kind of life. Right. And have the usual mundane kind of nine to five, kind of yeah, it's not nine to five but you know what i mean it's this this kind of yeah the toilet's broken you gotta fix it or the car needs to go to the mot this kind of stuff just didn't exist yeah you know you you've you're actually spoiled for for just pure paradise if you like yeah. Oh, definitely. I've experienced the same thing traveling. Yeah. They're excited yeah. They're traveling. They want to show you everything. And, and yeah, it's, uh, you get all these. And, and this continually for, for years and years is, <laughs> is actually quite, yeah, it's quite addictive. Huh? Oh yeah. It's like, <laughs> I mean, to actually sort of decide I want to like stop that. And, and like concentrate on a shop and maybe a little bit more serious about work and but then you get caught up in another kind of wheel right, <laughs> right. and you're like oh uh yeah i don't know if i oh uh <laughs> so um yeah, I thought I thought I'd mention that just because it it, it was it was years and years of this kind of being fed in a very very good way um but i guess um yeah at some point you've got to digest those uh experiences and you've got to sort of sit back and 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 let them kind of come out of you as well yeah it, kind of evolve. it ends up reflecting in the work you see it you're like oh this person has seen the world when you look at you know what i mean 
Yeah. Kind of tell that. I lost. I lost the. I lost the thread there, but never mind. Um, yeah. So I. I mean, I'll. I'll totally honestly say it's. It's like now. Even at, I'm coming up to fifty six. I am still digesting all that. Mm. Absolutely. There's. There's like. I mean, sitting and talking with you is 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 really fun actually to kind of express it because I, I yeah of course I used to like tell lots of stories I did I tell stories to customers and stuff but it's not so kind of on a on a, a real sort of path where I'm like looking for this way and and kind of reminiscing. I used to do it a lot more and I used to think, oh my God, people must think I'm boring, you know? <laughs> God, this is the most interesting stuff, especially for, for tattoos. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it, it is nice and it's actually, it's kind of good to give me a good kick up, kick up the fucking ass because I'm, I'm actually planning to like really write a book about this. Um, it's a, you know there's so many fantastic tattoo books out there i mean there's so many geniuses that i look up to highly i love their work i love uh yeah i mean there's there's loads of them yeah there's uh there's there's just fantastic uh kind of logs of people's lifetime of work and me personally yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't mind showing like my tattoos for sure, but um, it's it's much more important for me, I think, to to kind of share a few stories and um, yeah, I don't know how my wife's going to feel about it because I said I that I didn't want to censor it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to tell the whole story. <laughs> So yeah, we'll see. But this is this is good to to kind of wreck the brain. Eh? Yeah, yeah. And 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 then uh, on the on the other end of all this, you started to uh, end up. You ended up being one of the judges at at uh, a lot of tattoo conventions. Oh yeah, then the, the yeah exactly. This this started. I I can't even work it out. I guess. It was going to be the 10th year of Paris last year. Um, I don't think we judged for the first couple, but I think it was like eight, seven or eight years where Tim Tin had invited us to do this. And um, I think I, I don't see myself as like, oh, I know. No. I don't. I can, I I think I can. I can see nice tattoos and and ones with with an eye of like, oh, that might not last quite as long as this one. Or yeah. um, taste comes into it. It shouldn't. Um, but it it was really, I think, about getting a a group of us together that have spent so many years working um, and having the chance and the opportunity to, to work together on, on this, this kind of event, which turned out to be huge in the end. I mean, it was just it's mind boggling. Eh? Um, but it was really, really good fun. And I think what what made it work was also that we all became very, very close. I mean, we enjoyed the time together. We'd reminisce, but we'd also, we'd be in the moment. And we're trying to also um, learn about tattooing of today. Mm. I'm, to actually see what's going on now and like try to kind of keep up with the times, if you like, not maybe re um, 
reproduce this in our own words, but I'm sure that I've seen a lot of stuff in in these shows that just they it blew me away. It was like it was fantastic stuff, you know. All these newcomers coming and these these some of these tattooers, they don't even tattoo that long, and they are like fucking amazing, absolutely right. amazing. I mean. I'd, I'd be there with Philip. We'd be looking at something and we'd be like, Jesus Christ, like, unbelievable. How did they do that? Yeah. Uh, it's just like, I mean, especially for us, I guess it's like we're way down the line, but it's like, I, I couldn't even do it then. <laughs> and um, so, so you, you guys would know the difference between something that looks good while it's fresh and something that looks good and it's going to hold up over time. And those are the ones yeah. that impress you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also, the, I mean, some of the stuff that we would see as well, it was, it was, it was stuff that, that's not my personal taste oh. at all. Um, I think it was one piece was like with three tattooers done over three days and it was a complete body concept. Wow. And you can't take away from the fact that three guys got together and made a concept for the body. It worked visually. <clears throat> Technically, it was done great. And the way the the girl moved, it it was all good. It wasn't something that I was like, oh, that's you know, that's awesome for my taste. But it was done brilliantly. Um, and that's kind of where tattooing is these days. I mean, we just see so much stuff that is. Yeah, tribal stuff that is body compositions of um, Thomas Thomas or, well, there's a whole bunch of people now. It's like these, you know, um, the Japanese uh, stuff is like, whoosh, it's going through the roof. Um, yeah, it's uh, whatever. We've seen, we've seen stuff in London as well that is um, more kind of, the the color palettes and and this more kind of realist uh, realist fantasy stuff but it's also done with a lot of black shading mm. super solid color um and the way it moves on the body it's i mean it's incredible it's incredible it's just yeah, mind blowing. I mean, they're 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 really picking up on all the things that tattoos should be. Yeah, and um, sticking to this idea that it can only be like this, this, and this. Eh, not really today, you know. It's like that. Uh, of course, I love where tattooing came from. I love looking at traditional tribal stuff. I love looking at. Um, traditional Japanese. I love looking at lots and lots of stuff. But today it's like they're, they're taking it to another realm and, and it's, it's okay. Some of these guys aren't, you know, tribal people from Samoa or, you know, they're European, they're American, they're, they're Japanese. They're, so it's like, the, it's okay that they're, they're kind of, yeah, trying to find something new. Mm. Re reinventing the wheel, per se. But like you say, there's a sort of these check, the, the, this checklist of things that, that make it great, how, how it moves with the body, how it's, how it's cohesive as one piece. Um, when, when was your first bodysuit? When, when, do you remember? Um, yeah, you know, that, that was the thing, I think, I mean, today, that's interesting. It's like, there, there's young, young tattooers, they're on the road, they don't, they don't um, have a shop, and they manage to do huge tattoos. I mean, 
it seems like people today, it's like they're quite happy to sit three days in a row. Mm. Um, I mean, this was unheard of when I was when I was on the road. People weren't really doing that, or at least I was never pushing someone to do that. Um, so, in I think in the the first part of my tattoo career, which yeah, we're talking about the first ten to I would say. 13, 14 years. I haven't done a bodysuit. Yeah. I, I finished my, I think I finished my first bodysuit maybe 15, 17 years ago or something. Not that long, really, you know, in comparison to how long I've been tattooing because I never really had the, the kind of place where I was kind of put to kind of invest in that, especially with the way I work. Yeah? I mean, I'm working on, I guess I'm working on one of, I've died, what's a bodysuit? I consider it when it's the whole bloody thing, yeah? ankle yeah. to <laughs> neck. <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I, I haven't done that many of those. I've done plenty of your, your kind of backs down to, down to the, the knees and, um, but actual body suits, no, I haven't done that many. Yeah. Um, I'm still working on a few. Um, yeah, it's fun. For oh, sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like it. I said, back that back in the day, uh, people, the collectors weren't weren't looking for even full backs as much or, or even full sleeves they, they were wanting little things here and there and, and uh oh god yeah when i first came to stuttgart so that that was like 92 um working in the shop here was it was all kind of in the beginning it was just little tattoos and on spots where you know like at least a rolled up shirt you know that would cover it I mean, on the upper arm, no one would get something on the lower arm. I mean, this would happen maybe three, four times a year, something mm -hmm. like that, to get people involved in like something more than this was actually really, really hard work, yeah? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so that didn't didn't come for, for a little while after, right? Eh? It was like... I mean, now it's 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 totally different. Yeah, people come in for their first tattoo and want a whole back piece and like their arm. They talk about backs and and getting their three quarter sleeves and it's just wow. <laughs> it's kind of weird in a way because it was just not happening like that in the early nineties for me. Yeah. Um, but I'm grateful. I get my jab at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've still got something to put into tattooing. We were talking about, um, you know, longevity in tattooing and, and um, again, with these larger scale pieces and things like that. What, how would you describe uh, Either well, you know what makes a good strong tattoo in, in your opinion that that will survive time. What do you think the key elements are for that? Um, I think a little less is more. Mm. Um, this this I kind of like myself. Um. Black, black and grey is like for sure the the kind of ground to the whole thing because we don't really know what happened. Well, we do. Colours, colours in the end just kind of slowly sift away. Yeah? So if you really want to look at the longevity of a tattoo, then yeah, it should look good just in black and gray mm. and then you can put all your colors on top um i i, I must admit so like working in stuttgart now i mean i have seen color tattoos i've done 
um, 30 years ago and they, they still look okay. I mean, they, mm -hmm. the colors are still there, which I'm quite surprised about. Some so, certain colors, they kind of, kind of do disappear, but I think that's more the, the brand, if you like the, the, the um, certain kind of um, pigment that we used back then. Um, so, yeah, and like I say, it's like just for the readability, I think like too small, too detailed. Um, yeah, this can be a pr bit of a problem, mm. I think, in the in a super long time. I mean, this was something that Horiyoshi always used to, to uh, say to me when I'd come over and I'd be all excited and sit down in his studio and say, you know, I want to show you some photographs and put this little collection of photographs down on the floor. And, and he'd look and he'd just say, how old? And I'd be like, um, three years? And he'd spin it off to the side. How old? <laughs> yeah, you'd say like four years. <laughs> he'd spin it off to the side. And it was like anything under five years wasn't really worth talking about. You know, mm -hmm. it was like if it, if it had done the five year mark, it's kind of settled into the body. And then you can really see where it's going to go. Uh, and I thought, actually, that that was something that he told me when I was quite young. And it always kind of stuck with me because it was quite sort of disappointing in a way. It was like, uh, oh, fuck, actually, I don't think I've even been tattooing long enough to impress him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, yeah, we. I mean, we live and learn as well. It's like I. I hope that that's what tattooers do. You know, it's like when they're working for any length of time, and and people start coming back with tattoos. Yeah, we actually look at what we've done, and actually register like, oh yeah, well that works. That that holds up that doesn't work. Don't fucking do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's part of a journey. I mean, it, it's, um, it's sad. I, I mean, I do love that fucking thing on Instagram. I'm a sucker for stuff like that, but tooth, what is it called? The tooth, truth fairy. Truth fairy. I don't think I've seen it. Oh no. Oh, it's brilliant. It's like, a, it's, it's the flashy tattoos. Okay. And then it's a picture of the same thing healed up. Like, I don't think it's even six months old. Yeah. That's something and like the, that. what you mean. Yeah. The, the reality of the thing is just fucking hell. It's yeah. two worlds. Yeah. It's like, you know, Photoshop to the max. And then afterwards, it's just, what is it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's the difference. It's the the people who are tattooing for that photograph, and then there's the people that are tattooing for the five year, what it's going to look like down the road. Yeah, uh, very different yeah. type of tattooing, isn't it? It is, but you know, hopefully, um, hopefully they'll um wake up in their own time. You know. Mm -hmm. they'll be able to to understand that certain things don't work um you can still do a nice small tattoo and and details and stuff i mean i i i remembered i actually did i i it wasn't something super um this wasn't like super artistic from my side, but it it was a painting of this guy abroad that he absolutely loved. And it was all these bodies intertwined into each other, mm. you know, holding each other and kind of reaching out. And, um, and I did this tattoo on his whole upper arm and it, I guess it was like 13 bodies or something. Um, I kept it black and grey. I said to her, I, I 
don't want to do this thing in colour. Um, and I'd asked him, like, come back, you know, when it's healed and I get a nice photo. So I never took a photograph of this piece, but I remember it and I remember thinking, yeah, I want to know what that looks like. Anyway, the guy said, yeah, 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 I'll be back, I'll be back, you know, and then one year goes by, five years goes by. We showed up 20, what was it, 20, 26 years later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I got a photograph of it, and I must admit, I was kind of like, well, yeah, I kind of missed the boat on a nice photo, but it's still there, and it, nice. it's still kind of works you know it's still it's old of course it is yeah but it's still you know you can you can still recognize what's going on in it yeah. mm. what what would your daily yeah. setup be as far as um you know liners and machines and magnums or, or something you know like uh what, what's your kind of go-to um i like an, a nice solid line so, like, I, I kind of use a lot of, like, straight liners. So I use, like, a straight 9. Okay. Even a straight 11. Um, if I want to do something a little bit more detailed, maybe a 7 or 9, kind of where it's pulled together a little. Um, I mean, years and years ago, when I made my own needles... Um, I would make a nine, not even a straight one, you know, and it would be the same as an open nine now. Okay, yeah. And, I mean, like, Jesus, sometimes if I pick up a, a like, pre-made five or seven, I can make, I, I mean, I can make a line that looks like a type three. It's like, yeah. what the fuck is that about? I, I I really don't understand the the kind of progression of the whole needle thing. Yeah. Small because I think or something, right? Like, <laughs> I think it's kind of for me for me where I come from, it's kind of fucking nonsense, you know, it's too much. It's just mm -hmm. too much. It's like you know, I'm the kind of guy if I go in a shop and I wanna buy a pair of jeans I kind of know roughly which ones I want. And for anybody who doesn't, going in there is a fucking drag, right? You're going to spend all afternoon because there's fucking 500 pairs of jeans to bloody choose from, yeah? Yeah. Um, it's just, it, it, I don't think it's that helpful, you know? And it, it's the same stuff with colors and stuff, yeah? So anyway, back to the setup. So I'll I'll have like a a big liner, a kind of little bit smaller one that I might do hair or teeth or you know like uh, some patterns or something, and then um, yeah, I mean background stuff I try to do with biggest magnum I can depending on the, the, the size of the background. I mean, my work varies. It's yeah. Some of it's a little bit more traditional, kind of smaller background, and some of it's huge. So it'll be anything from a, a, a 23 to a 35 oh, wow. magnum. And then... Um, yeah, for the for the smaller areas of colouring, for for really packing in in tighter spaces, I I don't mind to go down. I mean, then it's like my biggest needle years ago, which was a fifteen. Yeah, has become kind of like something I might colour the teeth in with, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, that's um, what I'm curious about, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so everything's kind of been pushed. But I I remember when when Philip turned me on to that stuff, it's years ago. I mean, I'd see him working with that stuff and be like, fucking hell, how'd you do that? And he'd be like, oh, go on, you can do it. You know, like, and I'd be like, no. 
You know, I, I like my 15, you know, and then I kind of like, I tried a 19 and yeah, and even a 19 is kind of small now. Uh, yeah. When you get used to the 25, it's, it's the 25 is kind of all rounder. And mm. then the the bigger ones are like, it's just so much easier to get really nice shades. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really, my mind boggles. If I try and do that with a 15, it's going to look fucking choppy. I, I, you, I mean, it's going to be fine. Like, if you're going to look at it in three years, like Horiyoshi said, you know, it's going to look perfect. But in the moment, it's going to look like, fuck, no, what have you done there, you know? Um, so, it's it, yeah, it's just something that's really nice to work with. Uh. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Philip, not only did he uh, kind of start using those big mags before they became a thing, he invented them, right? But he also innovated the tubes to... to, to yeah. Uh, to care, you know, because because the wrong tube shape isn't gonna really work with them, is it? Like, no, I've I've got loads of big magnum tubes from from all kinds of people. Yeah, people used to make them and like bring them in the shop and drop them on me, you know, like and oh, they were they were fucking pain in the ass. I mean, I thought it was the needles, but it was actually the flow of the the ink and like how right. the needles were like sitting on these huge flat surfaces and yes just uh, it, yeah it just it wasn't working so you'd have to dip every two seconds which is kind of taken away from the the whole idea of it you know you want to have a little bit of ink flow sitting somewhere that will just be pushed over that nice little lip into the skin and you can work a little longer eh? i mean the whole idea is to kind of speed it up a little bit i think um yeah i i mean i've had i've had those big needles worked on me i mean they, they, yeah they they can be painful but yeah. they're fast yeah definitely so the pain ratio to the to the speed of it is actually like well worth it yeah i agree, I agree. yeah that you're uh -huh. actually gonna you're gonna get through this thing that much faster, yeah. Yeah. With somebody <laughs> messing around with a fifteen, yeah. Like <laughs> And you still you're using coils? I I am indeed. Yeah, nice. Yes. Um I I have tried like all kinds of like different different machines rotaries and and kind of uh, up and down kind of slide bar um, i guess they're all working with rotaries somehow um yeah i've been able to work with them um but i still do fall back onto like machines i think the only the the one thing that i would like really say that that did something for me for a little while when I was using a swash drive oh. I used to swash drive for a, for a little while and it was fine it was good it was fast it was it was easy to work with good good color good um I didn't feel quite so tired afterwards just because of the noise the noise was gone Mm. maybe also because the machines are tick lighter as well um but hey you know i'm an old dog as well i went back to my old ways and that blaring machine in my ear it's kind of like that's where i'm most comfortable you know <laughs> I'm, I'm, my wife's I'm... not too happy about it she says i'm going deaf <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Of course, I said there's nothing to do with tattooing, love. <laughs> I've been in shops where everybody's using uh, uh, rotary machines, and they're actually they all they're, they're not they're not used to the noise, and they'll look at me like like they're annoyed that my machine is so loud. <laughs> yeah, this is bizarre. Eh? This is the modern tattoo convention. 
Yeah. You walk around and you're like, fucking, is anybody working? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I went into, I went into like one of the oldest shops in uh, America and um, was visiting with Mike, Mike Roper took me down there and I, we walked into this shop and it's a little museum and, uh, and um, yeah, it w it was just like, wow, well, this is one of the oldest shops in America. It's like fucking, there's four people working and you couldn't hear a thing. What? They weren't even talking. <laughs> Weird. I think they had earpods in and like you know, like <laughs> they're listening to music and stuff. It's like it's just bizarre. It was like wow. So yeah, I've I mean I've had a few guys working or people working in my shop and they've got their you know got, uh, tattoo machines with silencers on. I call them like yeah. <laughs> And there's me in the back room. <laughs> I think they've become the majority now, though, haven't they? It seems like. I think the majority of people are using these quiet... Um, yeah, dildos. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I know everybody's going to hate that, but it's true. Dude. <laughs> I know. I know. It's no offence. No, and there's, and they produce great work with them and everything. I just the same colour. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I, I've, got, I've picked them up and tried that. I mean, there is, there is. Uh, I mean, I, I can understand the, you know, the attraction and the. <clears throat> I'm just wondering what you're going to do when the motor doesn't work anymore. You know, I can, I know how to fix my machine. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> You've also been painted by uh, a couple of uh, quite well-known artists like Jean Jean Le Bourdet and, and uh, Sean Barber, and uh, you know, in a way, this is quite cool too because this is another thing that it, it kind of solidifies you into tattoo history a, a, a little bit more as well. Because being painted like that by by another, you know, yes, another artist. How how does that how did that feel seeing that you know on on um, well, it's, it's actually, it's a kind of, it, it's an inner wish. Mm. You know, you see, I mean, you see the, the amazing work from Sean. I mean, Sean's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, the first time I saw his stuff, I was like really impressed and, and then I actually, I went, that was another show that I went to. I went to the music show. Oh, yeah. Um, I got invited, actually, by, by um, um, what's her name? Uh, Kat Von D. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. She actually invited me to go there. Eh? And I thought, wow, this is like out of the blue. Um, she stuck me in one of her books as well. Oh, cool. And I don't really know her. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But anyway, so I'm at this music show. And I see, um, for the first time as well, um, Sean Barber um, and Henry Lewis. Oh, Henry Lewis, yeah. So they, they were working and then they said, oh, yeah, we're in the, we're in the same hotel. Um, we're painting at the room tonight. You want to come up? And I thought, fucking great, because I didn't, I knew a couple of people, but I couldn't really find people on that show. It was really weird. It was, there were so many people I never met. And it's not like I can't, you know, that I can't meet new people, but um, yeah, it was a very different kind of vibe. So, um, anyway, I decided, right, I, yeah, I'd love to. I'd go and visit um, Sean Barber and, and Henry Lewis. So there are a couple of other people, but they were, they were painting in their, in their room. And it was like, oh, this is great. And having a beer and, and you know, like um, sitting up and, and people are doing stuff. It was kind of like the old days. Um, 
So this was the first time I met Sean and we actually got on really good. He's such a nice guy. He's like super open and, and sharing it. But yeah, and we got into a conversation about, you know, drawing and stuff. And I remember when I was working at Shotsy's, he said to me, like a good drawing exercise is like you put something in front of you and you look at it put your pen on the paper or your pencil and draw that thing with your eyes, but mm. don't look at the paper. Mm. You can do it with anything. You can do a portrait of someone. You can draw a fucking room. You can draw whatever you want, but the pencil stays on the paper and it doesn't come off. So you've got to imagine where you are, right? With your eyes. So what it does is it teaches you eye arm coordination. And now I always thought it was actually quite a good exercise. So I said for a laugh, I said to Sean, okay, like, let's do it. You know, I'm going to draw you, you draw me. So that's what we did. We lay on the bed looking at each other and we started drawing each other. And we did a few of them, man. I've still got mine here somewhere, Sean. Yeah, like, <laughs> but it it was um, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, to have this exchange and anyway, we we met at other conventions and Sean would sit and paint portraits of people on the show and and like also wander around and take photographs. And I remember him while we were judging that he kept like looking you know like he kept catching me around the convention and i think his his painting is like a, a kind of mix of of different hand movements and and different places and but it, yeah i was i was very 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 honored to, um <clears throat> to actually yeah, see it he captured more than just likeness, didn't he? He sort of, it was an animated sort of sequence almost in a way of capturing more than just the likeness, but your personality in, as well. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Crazy. I mean, the, the, he did it a few times. Eh? He did it, he did it on the, the actual judging panel one. Yeah. It's Bill awesome. and Carrie and that one, which is just off the hook. Oh, yeah. Um, then he did one of me alone, just with my yellow banana zoot suit on. Oh, yeah. Um, and then he did another one of us all driving to London in the checker cab. Oh, Because it was, it was me, Philip, Titin, Ch a guy called Chino, and um, Sean that drove from Stuttgart to uh, London. So he documented the whole thing, and then he did, like, the the interior of the cab, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, for those who don't know, Luke has a uh, a checker cab uh, from, what is it, 1950s or 60s or something? Yeah, no, actually, it's one of the last ever made. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's 1978. Oh, okay, okay. But you're very, you're, you're right on the, the, the button with the design didn't change from like the late 50s until 78. I was surprised how big it was because I'd seen them in movies and I hadn't actually seen one in person before. And you, you, you get up to it and it's like, oh. It's yeah. Well, the, the one I have is like a foot longer than, than the usual ones. Oh, okay. So it's like that got that little extra limousine thing. So, yeah. But they are huge. They are. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the, the the whole kind of passion and, and love for that car, it, it was like my Rolls Royce from when I was seven years old. I used to go visit my dad in New York, and we'd, at this time, we'd constantly drive around in those things. Cool. And I was, I was obsessed from seven years old. It was like, this is, this is the car. <laughs> this is so cool this car and just like the smell and like the the, the guys driving it you know like those new yorkers and they, oh it was brilliant absolutely brilliant so i was like one day i'm gonna get one of those 
<laughs> How on earth? It took a little while. How did you find one in Germany? Yeah, that's that's so bizarre because I looked. I also looked in the states. I'd I'd been in America just before I came back this way. Yeah, and uh, I'd looked in the states to buy one, and I kept finding really fucked up ones. Oh yeah, and I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to invest the money and try get it back to Europe and stuff. Um, so. Yeah, one day I I'd actually started. You get in Germany, you can write to these like people who sell old timers, and you can actually give them a car name and and tell them to go look for one for you. Oh. So I'd written to to three garages, I think, saying, you know, I want a checker. Da 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 da. Anyway, they wrote back to me going, "What's that?" <laughs> and I thought, all oh, right, forget it. Before you buy the wrong car, you know, like. Um, and then I went into town to buy a pair of shoes one day. And outside the shoe shop was a fucking checker cab. And I looked in the back window and I was like, this for sale thing on the, on the back seat. And I thought, oh, that's it. And I sat on the bonnet until the uh, owner came back. Wow. Destiny. That's how I found it. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, that's... I guess that was that was one of the tell um, tell telling and signs of why I actually decided to stay here. Mm. Like things started happening that were meant to be, and like maybe this was my town after all this time. Nice. Yeah, synchronicity. Yeah. And that's, of course, where Checker Demon comes from. Yes. As well as being, I mean, in the great respect comic. to, to uh, S. Clay Wilson. Yeah. I'm a great fan, but Checker Demon is, is part and parcel because of the Checker calf. Cool, cool. Um, one, one more thing I, that I was thinking about talking about with you was uh, I, I know you've done a lot of collaborative uh, art as well, like collaborative paintings and things like that. And, um, um, you know, uh, I know you've done some uh, some paintings with, with Philip and, and uh, um, probably a few other artists uh, where you're both working on the same painting together. Yeah. Um, what, when was the first time you kind of did that? What was, uh, <clears throat> oh my God, is that something, you, um, something that you've always done or is that something that you, you got introduced to you, uh, later on? Yeah, well, he, he is such a, a kind of great instigator. He's so open to share and to do and try and click with people. I mean, it, it's, this is, this is really, really a uh, uh, special quality. I mean, he, he really does um, have something that's like, okay, let's do it, you know? And, and he's, he's so not judgmental. He's so not, you know, he's just like, let's do it let's share let's you know and he's open to to like thinking uh about what you're thinking and you know sharing his skills um so we we've actually done it from for quite a while i remember we used to sketch a bit together um when we we spent a a, a period of time in new york together I was on my way back from Japan to Europe and um, we, I'd spend a lot of time with him, like, you know, end up passing out in their, their little rented room above Jonathan Shaw's shop. Cool. Um, this was great. Yeah. So, we, uh, yeah, we used to draw together then. And um, I guess it really started when when I would like go down to Lausanne and visit um, in the old shop in the Rue Centrale and um, he'd started doing those charcoals and, and we'd start to like work on some of those together and um, 
I think we worked on a couple of things in Ibiza together. Um, and then we, we actually did some like finished paintings together. I think I've still got a few of them around here. Um, and then we, we did some collaborative stuff with other people. We did one with Ichibe and Titine together and Junior and, um, yeah, if the people were there and they were into it and we had the time, why not? Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Like being in a band, isn't it? Like you've all sort yeah. of yeah. a functioning unit. Very cool. Is there anything else you want to, you want to close? Um, um yeah, there is, uh, I, I think, this time for sure, I, I would really truly like to thank like everybody I've passed ways with in this, this kind of tattoo journey. Um, I'm very, very grateful. I've, I've had a, a, an incredibly magical time. I still am. I still love tattooing. Um, it doesn't get boring. I still find interesting uh, people like yourself. Thank you for asking me to do this. And um, yeah, it's 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 just been a, a fantastic journey. And there's there's been many many generous um, characters out there. So I hope people continue to be generous to each other and and have an openness to to share and and you know it seems like um this is this is the way of the world these days um to actually kind of give a little yeah as well as get, as well as get it <laughs> yeah. very cool so, um yeah it was brilliant to talk to you again yeah, you as well. And um, I'll just I'll just uh, plug you here as well. You, you've also got uh, those prints by Marode available on it's checkerdemon dot de is it dot de um, checker slash demon slash press dot com is fine. Okay, I'll put a link in the description for people. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure if they're up there yet. But otherwise, you can DM me on Checker Demon Press on Instagram. Um, they've been going like fucking hot cakes. So yeah. hurry up if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to um, I hope to be doing um, lots more cool projects in the future. I'm working on a new book. Um, I'm going to be doing more prints. I've got a, a print that's coming out uh, in the next week from the wonderful Titine Lou. Ooh, that's going to be awesome. She did a, a fantastic print, so uh, maybe there's somebody interested in uh, that. And, um, yeah, she's, she's absolutely fantastic, too. Like, what's... what's uh, yeah, where, where she's gone from her tattoo portraits into... Uh, her own kind of um, imagery of of fantasism landscape with women and um, it's uh, yeah it looks like it's very successful for her and and she's she's yeah she's in famous museums in the world um, she's a wanted artist. So maybe it'll be interesting for you to see a new print from her. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Can't wait. Great. All right, All right mate. So, well, we'll be in touch for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much again, Jamie. Thank you. Good luck with your new, new uh, space. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, and good luck with and hopefully this lockdown all ends uh, sooner than later. Yeah, no fucking shit. I, I'm still at home, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. So buy a bloody print so I can have another beer. <laughs> I, I do. Agree. 
<laughs> okay. Love you and leave you. Cheerio, Luke. Take care. You as well. Ta-da, mate. Bye, yeah. everybody. Thanks for listening in. <laughs>